notice. Yep. yep All yep, right. Yep. We hey, are folks. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. As you can tell, just looking at the screen, I've got Grant Dalgleish that is in from Columbia Games. So, and very first, right off the bat, why don't you just introduce yourself? Let us know where you're coming in from. Hi, good morning. Yeah, well, I'm Grant Dalgleish, Columbia Games, and I am presently in the little seaside hamlet of Blaine, Washington. Right. And Blaine is as close to Vancouver, Canada, as you can get, <laughs> and and still be in the in the lower 48. Uh, really? So the border to Canada is like just over there. I can almost see it. Uh, really? So and you can just walk across if you wanted to. I could, yes. And <laughs> and I have a nice view of, of the suburb of White Rock outside of Vancouver. Uh, so a little sleepy little hamlet, um, Blaine, with uh, under 5,000 people. Um, but the, we have the metropolis of Vancouver uh, and its burbs right across the line. It really creates an, a neat dichotomy I, know, I, I have a big city at my disposal when i want to but i don't have to live it with nice. the traffic in the life although it got weird when the covid came along and shut the border down for 545 days uh wow. and we couldn't go to our couldn't go you know so I, we're from canada my, my father um came from scotland in uh, 1965 i think it was hmm. um and he settled in the Vancouver area with some family who had come just like a year before, um, also from Scotland. Um, and he ended up meeting my mother um, while uh, while he was getting settled. I think the, the story is pretty anecdotal, iconic, kind of a cool story about a sailor on shore leave oh. meeting a lady in a in a tavern and then a romance developing. And, and from that we get Columbia games and we get me and my sister. And then of course I've got some progeny too. So it's really a pretty important event. Um, but the time period uh, was a little, little um, turbulent in the States, as you know, um, Vietnam war is still going on. And um, my parents decided to settle together in Vancouver rather than in Portland, where my mother was, uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, and so that's what they did. And that was married in 67. Um, and he went to school to Simon Fraser University, got himself a history degree, yeah. and um, also worked for the BC Ferries to, to um, kind of power his, his economy through that time period. Uh, my mother started working for um, CP Air, which later became Air Canada, and that uh, was her thing. And I came along about eight years later in '75. And just in between there, the the segue that's really important to to our our topic of the day is Columbia Games was founded by my dad in 1972, so nice. three years before me. Uh, it was called Gamma Two Games when he founded it, and he founded it with a friend from university, Lance Guttridge, and they created this company together. And about a decade later, it was renamed as Columbia Games. Mm. Uh, but it's the same intact line. Uh, basically, my dad is the common element through the whole thing. Still today, uh, we we're working together today. Yesterday, I was over there helping him on the uh, uh, one of the functions in Adobe Illustrator to work on the map that he is fi finalizing for our game Alliance. Wow. So Alliance is an exciting topic uh, because it's it's one of our first attempts at a really built out of the out of the box multiplayer game um, from anywhere from one to seven players actually. So there'll be solitaire um, and then up to seven players controlling all of the major powers from the Napoleonic period. It's a grand strategic game. It's been quite a bit of a challenge to get it to all gel together and make it great. Uh, and then my dad's got a passion for the map in particular. He, he likes a lot of the different elements of this, but mapping uh, must be his favorite part for sure. Yeah. Well, you uh, guys have gorgeous maps. We That's him. Yeah, yeah. that's him. And, and what's kind of gotten 
uh, really interesting is over the years, it's evolved a little bit to where uh, with increasing more more powerful software that you can get um, and learn yourself, um, he's doing a lot of it in-house where there used to be a back and forth with artists or graphic people um, with a hand-drawn map and then that was slowly converted into a hand painted map and maybe letra set added on later for the type and, and we're talking the paper age here it's it's old <laughs> it's uh it's amazing how much that's changed very early on though in in the 90s um uh, even late 80s there was the macintosh computer that we had and the beginning of desktop publishing and layout and uh boy that that was a big change um and so it's kind of continued on that arc. And now with Alliance, we and he have control and and do kind of almost every different aspect of the the graphics, the layout, the design. We have a little bit of help from artists, um, in particular for like a painting type piece of art, like the cover art for the board game. Um, but we work internally on almost all the rest of it. And that is both a blessing and a curse because... <laughs> Uh, you you have now got the ability to be potentially perfect in your mind at least and right. so you work at it and you work at it and you work at it and we already had this game kind of locked up and finished and, and ready to go to press and he decided um, that it needed it needed a better map it needed ah. a, the projection on the map wasn't satisfying him so he set about reworking it and then he's been kind of mired in that for a little longer than we might like, but he's making good progress. I, I literally saw him yesterday. We were literally working on on the uh, the Danube River basin <laughs> together, trying to get it. And I had to help him solve a little technical problem with, with Illustrator that I, I happen to be pretty good at that troubleshooting stuff. So huh. we, we we work together well that way. We're getting really close on that. It's been a little painful, as I kind of intimated here, um, just because. Well, because it's late. Uh, sure. Par for the course sometimes with Columbia Games. We're, we're not often early. Uh, most of the time, there's a reason for it. The, the development and the, uh, and, and the playtesting are, are ultimately deemed more important than getting it finished. Uh, you know, and I think that's probably partly derived from, again, the entire history of the company and my dad's philosophy because he, oh. after all um, when he started this whole thing it was for himself it was a, it was a hobby and a passion and so i think we're relatively rare amongst publishers that um uh, were hands-on like my, my father becomes a co-designer or or sometimes even takes over the design of something that has been submitted and there's nothing that's ever been published as far as I can think that, that fits into the kind of class of a, of a vanity press or something where it was just published as submitted. Um, and again, there's a good and a bad with that, right? It's, it, uh -huh. it develops a good quality product. that helps fit a bit of a, a consistent, feel and with some consistent design philosophy some some positives there for sure right um, just like it, never fear it, here it, all it, here we go time. look he's pointing out exactly the point that the downside is sometimes it takes longer uh it, it is better I, I will agree with the commenter um i think i um 99 of folks well, I don't know percentages, but a good amount of people will, will accept that and agree with Absolutely. us. You get into trouble every now and then here, though, with with uh, just folks that just don't don't accept it. Don't accept that we're going to be delayed or in particular because the delays tend to be more delays. Sure. Well, they get excited and then they want it like I love 1911 here again. Never fear. Well, he already wants to know a well, hard master played on the yeah. channel well we actually will talk about harn master in a little bit as well there uh, yes we will yeah yeah, yeah i've got the harn map on the map. wall behind me there yeah we'll, we'll talk beautiful. about it yeah yeah again you can see the beautiful harn map in the back there nice 
that was the first thing I'd mentioned too. I was like, love the background, Grant. Love the background. Yeah, now that's, that, that's wonderful. Yeah. Now you're also right in the midst of your Kickstarter for Julius Caesar, the enhanced edition. Now, can you explain a little bit uh, what the enhanced edition is bringing forward? It looks gorgeous, but I'll let you talk about it. Yeah. Well, point number one is Julius Caesar sold out. It was uh, printed about 10 years ago and, and we sold out of our run here. Um, so most of the reason for doing what we're doing is because it's a great game and a good seller and we want it in print. So um, we're bringing it back as, as um, fits with our whole thing. In fact, just about every single game ever published by Columbia games or my dad, um, not quite everyone, but just about is <laughs> still in print today. Sure. And in, in a, a further edition, some of them have had multiple three, four, five editions. Uh, Caesar's going to go into a second edition here, uh, and we'll take that opportunity to upgrade the quality of the components. Uh, you know, we have improved or adapted with the times for this this whole fifty years. The Columbia Games has been around. Uh, when when it started, and the state of the art with war games was paper maps and cardboard chits, and um, you don't find that so much anymore. Um, the the qualities come up on on all of the manufacturing, the, the boards, the pieces, the cards are all better than they used to be, and it's a bit of a pendulum where, shall we say, earlier uh, Columbia Games actually did produce. Uh, some mounted board, board ga war games. The original Quebec 1759, for example, the first game published in 72. And we'll talk about that because we've got a 50th anniversary edition coming out um, oh. of that game. But it had a mounted map in the, in the, in the parlance of everything you might expect. Um, and it also had the wooden blocks. And so at that stage of the, um, of the hobby, our, our stuff was actually a notch up from the competition. Oh, definitely. People, your blocks, yeah, with yeah. the steps. Yeah, and pe so people noticed that. Uh, and then over time, uh, you know, over 50 years, it's gone like a pendulum where other um, companies and, and, and designers have pushed the envelope forward um, with better quality and better concepts. And then we like to try to say that we adapt to keep up. Um so that we don't get left behind. Uh, so yes, this new Caesar um, is is a really deluxe package, and sure. and I, I really say that earnestly. We um, have evolved to this position from uh, in 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 fits and starts, little little bits, improving the different parts to the games in the past, like the cards, for example, or were upgraded recent, uh, fairly recently in, in, in the series of games. And then uh, rule books were upgraded to color and things of that nature. Uh, but this is like the full thing, all being carefully crafted to be the, the best quality that we can in, in one shot. So some folks out there will have seen our most recent war game release, uh, Rommel in the Desert. Mm -hmm. That one is the standard. If you've seen that, then you kind of know what Julius Caesar um, quality production-wise is going to be. Um, very similar in terms of the, the size, scope, the box, the map, the heft. Um, and largely speaking, it's it's a an enhancement that is cosmetic. Like We're not changing this game. And we're not really asking people who have the game to run out and buy it again. It it uh, it isn't the agenda. the The agenda is to keep it in print and and right. introduce it to more folks. Um, the quality upgrade is is sort of a process that we're up undertaking that over time will probably uh, work its way through all of the games um, yeah. and. This is sort of just a nice beginning, uh, and uh, really happy with with that game. Really happy with the feedback. Really happy with um, 
how much the, the amount of times you can play it and still feel like it's it's fun to answer the question that's just popped up on the screen it, it's a board game um a, a, a war game a two-player war game of the roman civil war one of the most significant roman civil wars yeah. uh, and it's a good place to start because like never fear uh 1911 came on for some of my rpg stuff and where your company is really you can just tell the passion is you've got some of the best uh block war games for decades that Columbia Games have been putting out. And then the folks on the RPG side know the depth of Harn World and how far it can just go down, go down, and the beauty of the maps comes across. And because my role-playing side is just kind of, you know, I hadn't played since I was in the 80s as a kid, and then some of these new RPGs came in. And it was funny because I definitely, from the war game side, knew about Columbia's war games. And I think I'd seen some things with harm, but you know, I was, I even saw you on Trevor Duvall's show and I was like, yes, you know, look at these worlds that you're, you, you guys operate in. And yeah. so when 1911 asks, uh, that's perfect. And if you don't mind just for some of the role-playing folks that'll come in, cause we've got a cross culture, sure. let them know a little bit. I know the war gamers know about uh, the block system and how that fog of war works and the steps. Sure. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, we'll dance around as necessary in the conversation. It's a diverse company, um, and I have to be diverse to manage it, and I I can do it. I can thrive in that environment. So we'll, <laughs> we'll go from blocks. Uh, we'll go from gaming to RPG. We'll do whatever we need to do. Uh, yeah. So blocks, yeah, that's that's a, a whole thing. Uh, Columbia Games is now known for the block games, uh, but that is that is a genre. Um, a, like a subtype of war game um, that is, is characterized by the fact that the pieces are made of wood by itself. That's, that's an improvement from cardboard counters, but the most significant uh, mechanical benefits of the blocks uh, are that you stand them up on, on one end, a little like a domino um, although it's it's a it's a cute or square, not a not a rectangle. Stand it up on its end in such a way that you can see one side and your opponent across the table, looking at the other side of the map and the other side of the pieces, sees the other side of that piece. So then there's a little wooden piece out there on the board. Think Stratego for an image. Um, yes. And just like Stratego, there was information on only one side of the piece. So it's a sticker. The sticker will tell you whether that block is a British regiment or a Soviet tank. It could be almost anything, and you won't know. Of course, in the context of the game, you'll know a little bit, but uh, that's the point. So Fog of War is a, a beautiful mechanical concept that is handled very cleanly with the blocks in a, in a non-obtrusive way because you take your block I'm trying to illustrate a little block in my hand here and i got a picture on it with a little soldier or a tank or something and and numbers that go around the outside four three two one not always but usually four three two one and the number that is at the top oriented up is the current strength or number of that unit and it's dynamic from there. It, it takes a hit, you rotate it counterclockwise 90 degrees, and the three is at the top. Now that unit is like three quarters strong. In combat, it's three quarters as strong. It rolls three dice when fighting instead of four. And that's a dynamic process throughout the game. It also, the next step down is to two, so that would reduce the dice further. There's also a concept in, in most games of investing in, in replacements and reinforcements, and you dial them back up from, say, three up to four. That concept, step reduction and fog of war, they go very well together. They are technically separate concepts, step reduction um, by rotating the blocks on, on that angle and fog of war coming from the facing of uh, that concept. They go really well together. They do a few things. They make the game um, more replayable. It's different every time there's more emphasis on the strategy of 
the psychological strategy of playing, the the nuance of who you're playing against, your opponent. There, there's a lot more going on than simply calculating odds and maneuvering pieces in a sort of a mechanical method. Uh, yeah, a lot of feints. You can do feints because they know it's almost like they got intel. Hey, there's some enemy over there. Yeah. Um, and if you're moving, I don't know, cavalry quickly, obviously you're going to kind of give out that's a cavalry unit, but you might move it like it's a foot unit. You can. They go, to, they go to hit it, and all of a sudden it's it's revealed, and they're like, oh, my God, this is heavy cavalry. I'm in big trouble. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Yeah, we love that so much, and you get uh, in, intense moments, really exciting uh, turns of fate sometimes. Um, you get uh, the, that replay um, value, frankly, where you can play these yes. games again and again and again and still have a, have a different experience. You also get uh, – it, it fits with the philosophy that my dad espoused from the from the get go of um, less is more. So yeah. he likes to try to digest the complex concept of of a war into a, a, a package that's manageable and playable and cuts out the stuff that gets in the way and, and retains and enhances the stuff that that you want. Makes the experience positive without a lot of uh, rules overhead. Um, so our learning curves are intended to be short on mechanics, learn the concepts quickly, and then that stuff that I'm intimating about how blocks work once you know that, you know it, and it yeah, very makes uh, Hammer of the Scots or Wizard Kings or any other block game, uh, you're, you're 75, 80% of the way there already. Um, and there are a few more reasons for that with the, how the blocks work and the mechanics work too that tends to um, work consistently across all of these games. And in every case, the design agenda was – playability was to try to make it so that it is after all a game um because you you can make simulations and you can make games and it's actually really hard to do both in the same box uh so sometimes we are actually branded um history light by folks um and i think that's fine um it, it is an interesting debate about what that really means uh, because the the heavy that is being brought out when someone makes that reference is the gritty heaviness that comes with having, let's say, a very detailed order of battle, a very um, uh, advanced order of battle that's got a lot of parts to it. And... Perhaps a very detailed map with uh, a lot of spaces or hexes. Um, the Julius Caesar game is a point-to-point -point movement game. There's only 13 victory points on that city, and players are playing that game, or, or 13 victory points on that whole map, and you, you vie for control of those. You're playing with, at most, 30 blocks each, and oftentimes quite a lot less. It means that every block matters, every step on every block matters, every decision matters, and the emphasis is on you against me. Um, it is a really nice way, to, again, to get a lot of fun and a lot of replay value at the same time um, with without a lot of rules overhead, so, again, so we can focus on playing the game and... Ultimately, the head-to-head -head experience is, is psychological. It's, it's about outwitting and outsmarting with feints and bluffs and other things. Also, outmanaging you know, your opponent. Uh, whereas, you don't have some of that without, without the three things that I mentioned. The fog of war is a huge part of it. The step reduction is a nice part of it because it allows, like I was mentioning, playing Julius Caesar with only 20 or 30 blocks. That's because of step reduction that you really can accomplish all that. Otherwise, you'd need so much more. 
Uh, and so that mechanic just really beautifully encapsulates all those things. And the third thing is, is comes from those things is the philosophy of less is more and trying to put an emphasis on, on the humans that play. Uh, that's something that was kind of invented by my dad, Tom, Tom Delglish, way, way back. Uh, the blocks were invented in, in, a, in a fit of, of creativity that came about, I'm told, after he played uh, a classic uh, paper chit game um, about Waterloo, the Battle of Waterloo, and it had uh, your classic odds table CRT. Um, and so he's, this is, I think probably anecdotal story, but it doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it illustrates the point that it creates the motive that tells the story of where we're at now. It's that uh, he was um, charging up a hill with, with um, I think it was 28 factors worth of soldiers. And, um, at the top of the hill, defending was was seven factors worth of, of soldiers, and that 28 to 7 boils down to 4 to 1. And so well, my dad's going up the hill here with a 4 to 1 advantage, thinking, yeah, it's it's a shoe-in. I, I got this. And the <laughs> odds table generates um, um, attacker loss or defender victory or something like that. And in this version, that was that. It was the battle was over. Twenty eight guys just dropped, then seven lived at the top oh. of the hill. And he thought that's nonsense. I mean, <laughs> it just can't be, right? I mean, you might lose the battle. That's that's one thing, but you're not going to lose all twenty eight guys with with the other seven being untouched. So from right. that was born the desire to have step reduction, and um, so that it could be graduated. That things both players forces could lose some strength in the concept of the battle and from there it, it evolved at first the original pieces were dice literally like six-sided dice with six steps worth of step reduction just mm. how you turn the die and the fog of war part led to using a block instead of a die so that we had two faces to put graphics or image on and four faces to rotate around Perfect. and um, and and we really never looked back the the original blocks were handmade literally cut out of a out of a piece of plywood wow. put in a cement mixing tumbler with paint cranked up <laughs> really dried off that was the original originals then they go through all of the different imagination versions that you can think of, but and nowadays it's fairly, it's fairly sophisticated um, and sourced. The, the printing has come up a lot, and the, the quality is available at a scale now that little Columbia Games can manage it, uh, make our stuff look really good, and you wouldn't know. Your yeah. stickers look great. You've got that chrome kind of feel to them and everything. Yeah, we're, we're able to do really, really good stuff in such a way I don't think you'd really know if you didn't know that Columbia Games is just kind of a little family operation. It's mm. uh, it's by, by being around all these years and kind of keeping a lot of that stuff in print and consistent, it, it does create the illusion that we're a lot bigger than we are, <laughs> and I don't mind that. Uh, well, and you're right. Uh, Even on the table, your games – your games just look, you know, clean and elegant. And if somebody's just coming by and, and looking, it's so nice because right away a viewer, not, not, not a player, but just someone walking by can see, oh, these folks, they have hints of information, but not complete information. Yeah, and you so can pick that up just walking by because of yeah. the way the blocks are facing. Yes, and and it just kind of draws you in, and then even the numbers, like you were you were saying, of the blocks that are on the map, it's just clean. And but there's all these different choices, and then there's you know, so someone walking by can even kind of look and say, "Oh, look what he's doing over there." You know, it's yeah. almost like someone being able to look at a a poker hand and go, "Oh, he's bluffing them," you know, and, and they can, you know, they just can see some of the the wheels turn on their own. Yeah, yes. Yeah, the deeper level of gameplay that you can do. 
Yeah, and it's so neat how that the it's deeper and yet just so much less to get there. Like right. it's a little um uh, little cliche nowadays, but I kind of tritely say that I have a no tweezer policy. Mm. That uh and and I'm vindicated lately in in, in our customers uh it's an aging demographic yes. and uh, <laughs> i'm nearly 50 myself it's it's uh it, it is it is the way of the world so i've i've been told a lot that I, people appreciate the the big wooden blocks and the, their heft and their ease of handling um so that uh it also looks good on the table when you're walking by you you can you can see what's going on with a little less. It looks like the old war rooms from the movies, right? Where right. somebody pushing the blocks around a map uh, with a stick. Uh, and uh, you feel yeah, like... It looks like Britain during the Blitz, you know, when they're shoving those, uh, you know, the, the different flight wings that are coming in on the map. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has that feel for the observer. For the observer. And then when you're actually playing it, it's a little bit the same. It's just, yeah. uh, it's it's relatively high level decisions that you make and then then you might get down to some tactical fighting or battles that where the results of your previous decisions kind of come home to roost uh, because one battle can make the difference uh, right these games Caesar in particular, not not just focus on that because we're we're working on it and we're reproducing it and stuff. But uh, a Absolutely. lot of them have a similar feel to them, um, where like I was trying to intimate, every move matters and every decision matters. I can't tell you how many times I've played Caesar, and that it has literally come down to the final battle and the final even final die roll mm. uh, to see who actually won the game. And that's pretty special. It's it's intense right down to the end quite often with right. uh, the possibility of, of a swing of fortune and, and a comeback or uh, and you don't always see that a lot of a lot of games um, once somebody's ahead they're they're ahead and it's gonna snowball uh, and and someone's gonna resign um, right. You don't see that a lot in, in say, Caesar or uh, some of the other games, Richard the Third, Hammer of the Scots. Um, they're actually worth playing right to the end. Multiple reasons for that, actually. The, the fog of war, the uncertainty means that you, you may not be as far behind as you think, or you may not be as far ahead as you think. Uh, <laughs> that's a very nice aspect. It gives you a reason to just keep on playing and hold your, hold your strategy and, and bluff. Never right. let them know that you're down or that you're weak. It, it, it makes it easy. Uh, so the, the the entire design philosophy and, and package of thinking has uh, been refined over all these years. As I mentioned at the beginning, it was started with Quebec 1759, published in 72, and that created this genre of of block games. And I think one of the highest compliments that you can have is to be imitated. Um, yeah. So it came about that some other folks have put out block games. Um, Semi-ironically, those games were always presented to Columbia Games yeah. um, first. And for one reason or another, not released by us. The reason actually is more often just a matter of time and energy rather than necessarily an actual comment on the design um, sure. because of the philosophy that dad has and taught me that he's going to be involved um that also makes him and us the bottleneck mm -hmm. so on the for better for worse dichotomy the worse side is that everything takes a while uh and we're more linchpin or bottleneck and some designers historically um weren't willing to wait out that process uh, not i couldn't say i blame them it's uh 
it's just a uh, it's a bit painful sometimes to to be on the other end of that where you're, you're waiting and waiting I've, I've experienced it in other ways in life so i kind of understand but it works right sure. and the relationships that do get formed say justin thompson myself and my dad who all work together on caesar or we've got jerry taylor who brought um hammer the scots to us and crusader rex later and richard the third later well all three of those games were heavily reworked by my dad and myself and jerry taylor or justin as a team and and that process uh again it's good and bad right it takes time it can aggravate some people on the <laughs> design side uh on average we might say that they're if they're overly aggravated by the influence of of my dad who's trying to make it better they're probably a little prima donna actually and it's probably not going to work real well relationship wise anyway you might figure that out early on from that that concept because the ones that worked, Jerry, uh, Craig, uh, Bazink, and Justin, uh, just to name a few names, they all understood that it is a cooperative process and that it's worth listening to the opinion of someone else. And my dad's experience in particular, sure. um, it's worth a lot, right? I mean, it's just, yeah. it's, it's worth a lot. And so when you run into someone who doesn't want to talk about it, we probably won't see that game come to light. And I think in truth, that's how it came to pass that a block game was first published by another company. Huh. Uh, since then, there's been quite a few of them. It's now actually really a genre in its own right. It is. And I'm delighted with that. I uh, yeah. I think it's, it's a marvelous compliment. I have actually noticed though, that it isn't inherently a fact that a block game, uh, a block game, the big, big label there, which is means any publisher, any topic, right, is just a game, just a war game using blocks, right? It, it could still be elegant or inelegant, depending sure. on the other factors. Uh, so. Although it's you naturally gravitate towards more elegant because the blocks, well, they're a little bit expensive for one thing, and so yeah. we don't want to put a hundred or two hundred or three hundred blocks in there. Neither would you want to play with it. Uh, that does lead you down the road of the less is more and trying to uh, compact things, but it doesn't necessarily mean every designer and company and philosophy will approach that in the same way. Um, so. It isn't a hundred percent true that all block games are the same. Sure, um, they they differ quite wildly, uh, even internally in our company. Even just in the East Front, and those games are quite a lot different from Quebec seventeen fifty nine. Hundred uh, percent. And then there's yet another set of variations from some other games and other companies. And all of it is a wonderful thing that if it's a compliment and it legitimizes these blocks um, in some, in the minds of some people that otherwise might never have seen them. Uh, and it enables me to get past or, or shrug it off when, when someone makes a, a joke about them. My favorite joke that I love to shrug off in a, in a funny way was a, a guy who told me that he put away his blocks when he was four. Oh, come on. And so, you know, he's being a little bit uh, yeah. deprecating on this, uh, the concept because He's used to the stacks of wood, uh, uh, pl uh, cardboard chits. Right. And there's an assumption that he made and others have made that if it doesn't have all that stuff, it must be a kid's game. Sure. Uh, so sometimes you run into that and, and it's, um, it's always a really nice thing to experience the aha moment when people see it and realize, oh, you actually can get a lot out of an experience absolutely less overhead yeah uh, you've got after all, you know we only have you know one afternoon at a time right if we're going to play let's enjoy it and uh the experience should should leave you wanting to do it again 
kind of unfortunately for the hobby and as a whole, um, there's a period of time where games became more and more complex down towards that monster extreme. And they, they kind of branded the entire hobby in that way, in such a way that many people maybe potentially coming into it are scared right away, right sure. off from just the size and scope of how much there is. And, and then it's also equally true that it happens all the time that you find out introduced to a new person uh, who's never seen these kind of games at all, whether they're other companies, chit games, war games, block games, just nothing like it at all. Their experience is maybe risk and, of course, monopoly in those kind of games. And I, I love it when that happens uh, because what I've got there is an unbiased war gamer uh, as opposed to one who's got 20, 30, 40, 50 years of bias built into what they like. And sometimes there's a bit of an uphill climb there to convince them of the validity of, of this less is more and of the blocks and how how it's worthwhile because they they come from the place where there's all that going on. Right. Well, one of the things that you certainly are, would be aware of that with all that going on, it's hard to find anybody to play with. Mm. And it came to pass that a lot of these games uh, are played solitaire. Mm -hmm. um, and that's cool. I mean, it's a hobby that is a, it's a thinking man's hobby, a solitaire experience. Um, is 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 a perfectly great way to explore the history and and that's what we're doing here. That's why we like it. Sure. But you do miss something when you don't have another human being on the other side of the table. It's the same as trying to play chess against a computer. You know, you miss something, and um, you can't necessarily have that if you have too much rules overhead or too much setup time. Um, so one of the nice things about the games that uh, yeah, from the beginning, the Quebec 7059 game published with a, a, a board that's seven, um, 12 inches by 34 inches. It fits on your table, no problem. Had 48 pieces um, and a short little rule book. You know, it, it's, yeah. uh, it doesn't take that much. And yet the experience is it's engrossing. And when you're done playing, you just want to play again and yeah. try it a little differently. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really neat that way. And the evolution of that all these years is both unchanged in that the Julius Caesar, for example, you know, it's our maybe state of the art game at some levels. Um, it harkens back heavily to the war of 1812 game, which was the second Columbia games published in 1973 and i mean amazingly so the caesar in particular has a naval component with ships occupying uh, sea spaces in the mediterranean and you own uh if you own a ship in in a sea zone exclusively meaning there's no enemy contesting it you can step effectively like a stepping stone across that body of water to a port on the other side. And that's how we did it in the War of 1812. So 1973, same system with a, the two Lake Ontario, Lake Erie in the middle of the board. And you're, you got ships and you're out there struggling to have ships on the lake. And actually in, in 1812, the history there is fascinating because they were building the ships on the lake. And so there was a like an arms rush as well as a strategic battle going on and see the comment here from uh, Derek. It's, yeah, look uh, at that. It's true. And it's still holds up. Yeah. You know, 50 years later um, because the, the value comes from the playing uh, and trying to outwit your opponent and, and that kind of stuff uh, makes you want to do it all again. Uh, and um, so that philosophy has been going now all these years. It's, it's my agenda to keep it going another 50 years. Uh, I can live that long. There you go. Uh, hey, a question from Frankfurt, Germany. 
Wondering yes. about the avail availability of a neoprene mat for Crusader Rex. Mats were available for Caesar, Richard III, Hammer Scots, but not Crusader Rex. It's true. That's uh, on in the pipeline. Um, I won't commit to a date or a time right now, um, but we, we've been really delighted with the response um, from people who have been using these maps. To make it clear for the rest of you, the neoprene is the material that they're made of. Um, a more colloquial term is mouse pad um, material. Uh, they are uh, the same maps that come in the board games, but usually the double size uh, yeah, big, or big. something like that. And then silkscreen printed onto this neoprene, which is so nice. It's durable. It, you can crumple it up and it kind of uncrumples back on the table. You can actually run it through a washing machine if you need to. <laughs> uh, it uh, rolls up so that it's kind of out of the way and then unrolls really nicely on a table. It just really looks good. You're talking about that imagery of uh, of the war room, you know, pushing your pieces around. Those neoprenes unroll in one piece. You don't have the, the classic folds in the map. Right. It just looks so good. We've been really happy with the response. You know, I didn't know that when I started, that, that people would be okay with it because they're not cheap, you know. Right. Um, so it takes a special kind of passion to um, to spend that money. And I value it and I appreciate it so much when, when gamers do that. It says a lot. So we will come through with all of them in, in due time um, and trying to improve that concept uh, where we can bring them in and, and keep them because they, they are uh, historically we brought them in and sold them out and then there was a bit of a problem is what do you do now because you, you always have minimums that you need to order with anything and that that's one of the great challenges about keeping things in print whether it's the game or just this part like a map like we're talking sure. uh so i i have lately uh, tied it to a release of the games like the neoprenes they were they were pioneered in their own regard as as he mentioned uh, on like uh, as a standalone element but then it's it became more cost effective and and just business effective to combine them and, and like release them at the same time. So Rumble in the Desert um, Enhanced Edition, which came out last year, um, at the same time as we did that, we brought out a double size neoprene. Um, so uh, Crusader Rex uh, to be. Um, to guess about when that would be, I would probably say sometime in the middle of next year wow. um, that you're going to see both the, the an enhanced version of that game and a neoprene to go along with it. Very um, nice. And so that's um, that one is was was been one of our more successful. We're already onto our second edition of Crusader Rex, and we'll be moving on to a third pretty soon. There's also Hammer of the Scots going to be. Uh, brought up to, uh, another notch in quality sometime in the future that same way, um, probably next year. Uh, see the question there on the board about new yep. releases. You're nailing oh, it. Lots of them. Lots of yeah. them. Uh, and more than we can handle, really. The um, most important one to discuss would be Alliance. That is, I've kind of mentioned it a couple times here, and the conversation flowed in and out of that alliance is a block game a war game from uh, uh the napoleonic period so we're, when we're talking about alliances we're talking about the shifting alliances and and coalitions that were famous for that period hmm. um, basically everyone against france but um it was different combinations of everyone and sometimes france had some allies and so the alliances shift in in the course of that war different packages of, of uh, countries working together and we wanted to capture that in the game so we we did we've got a game you can play anywhere from one to seven players and the one is solitaire which we actually really consciously worked to build into this game oh great and seven means that every one of the races uh that all the armies are all being played britain and france and russia 
Prussia, Austria, Spain, and the Ottomans. Mm. Um, so you can also play that game with two players um, or three players, but it, where the rest of those countries are what we call non-player empires, and they're effectively still there and they defend, uh, but they don't do much until you work to get them into one alliance or another. Uh, again, that has a lot of replay. Every time you play it, the alliances work out a little different. The fog of war makes the game work out a little different. It's been a lot of work to get that one done, and it has slowed up You know the whole process of running the new development um, because we can, as our, our, I talked about bottleneck, we can only really do one thing at a time, in particular if it's a, a fully intensive thing uh, like a design, I was able to um, to put the Julius Caesar um, reprint and an upgrade on Kickstarter kind of in parallel because because we're not redesigning that game. So the, the overhead, the work that's involved in that is, is my work to do some graphics, uh, touch-ups and things and package it up for a printer. It's quite a bit more manageable than starting from scratch on a new game. But uh, coming back to the question that he had um, about new stuff that you haven't heard about at all, we do have some cool things coming. Uh, they're still maybe in early forms. Um, one of them that I'm, I think is going to be really excited uh, is broadly been called Strongbow, and it's about oh. the Norman conquest of Ireland. Uh, it's a little bit like Hammer of the Scots in that you got the fickle Irish who um, sometimes will cooperate and sometimes will not. They're certainly more interested in their themselves, but sometimes they have to work with the Normans. And there's some Scots involved in that too. It's, uh, it's a, a design that... Um, really looking forward to because i i personally love the medieval stuff the it i don't know why but it just floats my boat the um the medieval time period castles and knights and <coughs> all that stuff just fires my imagination so that one um uh, is is it's probably one of the next truly new games to come out from us and no one's heard about it. No one's talked about it because I kind of got myself into a habit here of, I want, I'm trying to improve the process of letting people know about this game when it's kind of, when it's stable. So that sure. the learning, the waiting curve is, is a little less. So, so we don't have a, a four year wait before it comes out. I'm going to tell you about it now and you're going to see it a year from now. And, I'm not even going to talk about it all that loudly until God. I have a lot more to show and say. Um, but yeah, that's coming. Another thing um, we've been working through this process of, of making computer games out of these games. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a bit of a process. It's both wonderful and painful at the same time. Uh, we partnered up with Avalon Digital. It's a company out of France for the doing of this. Uh, Philippe Thibault, who's the, the man behind Avalon, uh, is a great guy. His, his best claim to fame in this relationship is that he's a gamer. And um, gamer first, businessman second, shall we say. Um, that's always good and bad, you know, in, in a sense. But it's really good for what we're looking for which is a commitment to quality uh, and a commitment to the game representing the game. So Julius Caesar um, on Mac or PC, playable through Steam, uh, is a really close representation of the board game. Um, and we're working right now to make it even better. And there was uh, Richard III was the first launch in that uh, in that genre, Julius Caesar was second. Uh, we also have a Hammer of the Scots in an early beta testing. Um, but all three of them 
are uh, you know 80 percent maybe they're just not quite ready for prime time in, in my humble opinion uh, and the, of course the people would agree i think on average they, they look good they play well uh, but they these games have ai in them and that hmm. was by itself that's revolutionary because sure. i've been i've been dreaming of computer block games since the dawn of computers and we had uh, we had computer east front in 1994 wow that's how long ago and it's still playable frankly um, it, it's a an old 16 bit software you need uh, it's hard to get it installed and, but it still works and it actually um uh, it's solid but mm. but it's um uh, two player you know you need another human and sure. it's a whole nother animal to get the computer to play against you um so we've got it working in caesar and richard the third and but it's not it's not good enough. Uh, yeah. You can you can whip it, you know, if you know the game at all. <laughs> and um, so, my response to that was at first it was uh, let's keep working on it. And so I pushed a little bit. Um, and Philippe had a partner who was his coding partner, and so Philippe pushed with me. Um, on on uh, we had to keep going and develop it and we we lost that guy because he didn't want to keep working and that's how it goes sometimes sure. so uh, a little bit of time went by and um uh, but i'm really delighted to, to report that philippe and avalon made a partnership with another development house uh they're out of spain and they have been tasked with improving um the ai and also a couple of aspects of the interface that, that needed a little work um the multiplayer uh because you can also play human to human uh through the right. internet um and that uh was a little janky sometimes would would freeze so uh philippe's committed with the spanish company to effectively throw a bunch more money at this project and i i'm so happy that he's doing that because um, it's the right thing to do. Uh, these games could be vastly more successful than they are uh, because there's a, just, a, I guess the number one piece of evidence is I personally want to sit down and play a Julius Caesar against the computer. And if I'm going to do it, as a replacement potentially for a human being or, you know, like a filler game or something, it better be good. Um, sure. And so we're just not quite there yet. Uh, and, and that's both disappointing, but also I have some optimism and positivity about it because we are still working on it. And it's a brand new active thing that that Spanish company was contracted just three, four weeks ago. Um, They've already done some work. I already received yesterday a, a new beta test um, of Julius Caesar. And um, I haven't done much with it, but I did fire it up and it runs. Uh, and um, I am super excited about putting some time and energy into that. I, I my, my contribution is, is testing and commenting and feedback. I'm not a coder, but I do understand computer code quite a lot. So I do look at it and um, and make recommendations sometimes. Um, and, and then and, on that, sorry, on that note too, because um, there's some questions in the comments. I know Julius Caesar on Kickstarter is starting to get close to the end. Do you what? How many is it? Six days left? Yeah, it's just it's a short one. We're bringing it out uh, we just gave people two or three weeks to to jump on it again i, I want to stress that the model isn't to resell this game to the same customers sure. um so um we're out there looking to grow the next generation of block gamers and and new people in this wonderful hobby um so it's yeah it's short and sweet it does end next week um we do have enough support there to get the game printed. Um, it hasn't blown me away in terms of response. Uh, okay. I'm going to speculate largely that that is multifold. Uh, 
the fact that we haven't completed alliance is probably the biggest factor that causes some folks to be gun shy uh, rightly um i am committed i will say it again i am absolutely committed to both alliance will get finished caesar will get finished mm. and columbia games has a long history of always getting things finished yeah uh, like you said almost all of your games almost all are even in print yeah so the caesar kickstarter has been maybe a little bit lackluster from a empirical standpoint but but from a the actual purpose which is to fund getting the game back in print it'll do the trick sure it, we'll we'll have the game and it's it's one of our marquee games that uh, sells the kind of evergreen all the time um so uh, yes we only have a few more days uh, we'd welcome some more support and some more orders but not to worry if you don't jump on it now the game will be uh, on my website ad infinitum uh because um like i said we we're proud of them once they're published they're they're going to be here hopefully for another 50 years yeah and, no that's um, perfect that actually is i mean uh, even what you just said there you you're not even telling folks rush out now because you know you're going to keep this in stock this is just one of the ways to get it back in stock offer up that neoprene mac because you don't know you know i mean if it blew up that you know 8,000 people want the mat. Well, you wouldn't have known that unless you had that Kickstarter and that, you know, yeah. you know, so yeah. that's a perfect way to figure all that out. It really, it's a good, a good concept. A very, this Kickstarter is the, you know, the, the broad term for its crowdfunding. Uh, that is a, a modern term, but it's actually an ancient concept. Uh, I'm reading uh, not too long ago. I read a book about uh, the history of maps because I just love maps. So I read about the history of maps more than once. I've done that in different books. But this one book talked a lot about uh, how maps evolved from sort of artistic and, and schematic type things into actual maps and charts and, and the process that was evolved in that. And it sort of dovetails a little bit with printing and the Gutenberg, uh, the publishing of books and sure. things like that. And my point here is one of the first things that was printed on, say, a Gutenberg press, aside from the Bible, uh, was an atlas, a mm. book of maps. And it was sold on pre-order. Mm. People ordered it in advance. So the concept sure. is 500 years old but and maybe older. But the um, uh, latest evolution with Kickstarter um, – it's it's a platform that's very well set up for this concept, right? Because yeah. you can communicate with with folks, and it legitimizes what we're doing. If you've never seen us before, it's easier to put have a trust relationship with that sort of detached third party from Kickstarter as a neutral middleman. These are all the reasons why it works so well. Um, we've just loved it. We're now. 10 years in, I did my first Kickstarter um, with Napoleon, a re-release of the Napoleon Waterloo game, one of the other early Columbia games from 1974. Now, we released it its fourth edition in uh, the, uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, the, uh, and so we Kickstarted that. I remember one of the uh, one of the kind of taglines was everything old is new again. And oh. that was about the 40th anniversary of that game when that happened. And we have then just been doing Kickstarter after Kickstarter. Uh, but, but like I said, prior to, prior to Kickstarter, we did, we did pre-orders. We, sure. we had a, a subscription program. We had a, something called auto ship where you could sign up and get every new game we published. And we had a couple hundred people that did that. Uh, and, that model worked just fine. The Kickstarter model has sort of replaced that. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit better. It's easier to communicate with. Uh, but man, uh, the the common element is the passion of the of these gamers of the fans. You know, we couldn't do any of this without all that enthusiasm and passion and support. Uh, it's really heartening. Uh, 
you know, this isn't hardly a job for me. I mean, mm. it, it, it is my full-time thing. Um, I do a little bit of real estate selling and investing on the side, but that's on the side. Columbia Games is the main fiddle. And nice. um, I'm blessed in that way. Uh, and of course, I'm thankful for all of the um, years and years of support from, from customers. Uh, and it is a bit of a win-win there, right? I mean, uh, they're happy and I'm happy. Uh, oh, no, that's perfect. Yeah, they're beyond yeah. happy. I mean, I hear people ecstatic. I mean, again, I had Judd, who's been on the ham tag stuff, just telling me that, uh, man, that neoprene mat looks so gorgeous. You know, he's excited and calling me and stuff. So and Judd is how I met you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. He is a heck of a guy. Uh, I, I even wrote him just to re refresh my contact with you recently. So sure. uh, it brought back, I mean, I love that guy. So oh, it's yeah. uh, a bundle it, of it, energy. It, yeah. <laughs> he's great. And, and so we, um, we really do appreciate that. It, it it makes this fun, you know, more than work. Uh, it, there's some friendly relationship aspect to it. I um, travel all over the world, you know, historically been been to conventions and events in different parts in the world, uh, in, in all over the States and Canada and, and Europe. And I love the meeting of the people. Uh, doing things together with people would go out to dinner with people or I've spent the night in some gamers houses before and played on their kitchen tables. Like Perfect. I was invited in there a little bit like a rock star. And it's really <laughs> you bet. Cool. I mean, I'm a little bit humbled. Um, do they have you sign their game. They do. They there you go. Do. I'm feeling, yeah. I'm feeling like a, maybe a little big for my britches there in that sense, because <laughs> it doesn't, it's, it's odd to me, but at the same time, it does it does make sense and and so i love it i'm 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 out here peddling fun and absolutely and i can i can do that all day um uh, it also helps to be uh, I'll, I'll use this for a segue into this question here it also helps to do a few different things so yeah columbia Games is actually a bit of a diverse company uh despite the fact it's just me and my dad head manning it here and um there have been other people uh, involved over the years, um, some in-house, some um, remotely, both designers and writers and artists and, and actual in-house type staff. Uh, and my dad has kind of gone with the times. He said uh, expanded when he needed to and, and uh, retracted when he needed to, um, adapted to the different aspects of the industry um war games when they were big even some family games back in the in the, in the day um uh, harn came around in 83 and that was a bit of a heyday for dungeons and dragons and role playing and he was jolly on the spot he got right in on it and that happened i'm gonna come back to that story and finish this little arc real quick and then come back to the harn story um sure. because that kept on going through the years uh the collectible card game craze came about in 94 uh when columbia games my dad came up with dixie uh our civil war card game yeah. modeled on on the block game mechanics for battles that are found in bobby lee our civil war board game which were modeled on napoleon mm -hmm. 1974 still still works so dixie came out and it was um I recall very specifically like fourth card game to come out um, after Magic and Spellfire and Illuminati and then Dixie. I remember mm. it real well. And not long after that, there was multiple hundred different titles that came out and a plethora of, of releases and eventually a bit of a bubble that popped um, right. in, in your classic sense. Um, but he was, and, and I, you know, he was there and adapted and then when that bubble did pop it didn't kill us we we moved on and adapted into some other things uh that in in our roots um and so for example harn is a really interesting yeah uh story there in how right now it's on the ascendant for sure we we're 
done well with it. We're, we're, we're working hard on it. I think there is a bit of a chicken and egg there. The harder we work and commit to it, the better it does. Mm -hmm. But then there's a feedback loop and we, we get some, we get the feedback and the, and the sales and that motivates us to keep going. Um, and it doesn't take too much to grind that feedback loop into a negative feedback loop. Um, mm. um, we found that the best thing you can do with Harn is just keep publishing. Um, so we've evolved a quarterly um, release schedule with 32 pages of new material for Harn um, every three months. And we've been on uh, pretty much lockstep doing that now for about 15 years. Um, and here's a good thing for the for the viewers because this is the cool thing about my channel. Just like the role players that came on, I think they knew you from Harn. Then you gave them a little primer on block games, and they're like, "Oh, for the war gamers, because there's so much cool stuff Harn wise." Can you give a little primer, a little baseline of what Harn is for them as well? Yeah, well, it, Harn is the, the really unique thing. It's a a world, a fantasy world that's designed specifically for gaming. Mm -hmm. So in role-playing, uh, sometimes there are role-playing games that were crafted out of, a, out of a movie or a book or something, and then they're kind of constrained by that lore and that concept. Uh, Harn, from the conception, was designed as a role-playing world that you could adapt and, and work with in, in myriad different styles um any type of role playing that you might like should fit in there uh, with a, a bit of an emphasis on the classic medieval D, &D right. era type role playing um but actually there's even room for some other fancy stuff in there like uh with higher some uh, porting oh, yeah. in from external worlds and other systems but but we'll come back maybe to that what happened Originally here in 1983, a, a gamer, artist, genius writer named Robin Crosby came to a Vancouver game club with that map that's on the oh. wall behind me and showed it to my dad, who fell in love with it immediately because it's a great map. Yeah. And um, that map is drawn by hand, uh, pen and ink, Pantone markers. It's wow. it's artistically, let me see if I can get out of the way here for folks. Yeah, it's artistically I mean, well, really satisfying. It's also sort of scientifically or geographically pleasing um, and and somewhat accurate or, or believable, plausible. Um, and then there's a lot of nice detail. You can't see it necessarily from here, but there's castles and keeps and cities and stuff dotting that map. Right. And um, so that was presented to my dad along with some supporting material describing and he fell in love with it and he became a role player he wasn't really a role player which is a segue from where you were it, it can happen that you can go from role playing to board games and back again um oftentimes you didn't know you would like it um right. until you got there anyone who's playing anything by tom by my dad or anything from columbia games in the historical sense would like harn and one of the reasons is because there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of of my dad in there. So it's a teamwork effort. Uh, Mr. Robin Crosby, who presented it to us at the beginning, uh, had a, a bit of an agenda uh, to have it published. Um, it was my dad's idea to craft it into a system that could be used with um, a, a world that can be used with any game system. And then it was also his contribution that made it gritty and realistic. Mm -hmm. That's what my dad likes to do. So what we created there is a world that you can play in or with. And it's a little bit like a sandbox. There is, yeah. you can build any castle you want. There's a lot of stuff. There's a whole world. There's at the biggest level, it's a world, meaning it's a planet. It's, a planet with continents, with plate tectonics, with ocean currents and prevailing winds. And, and these are all mapped and explained in, in a plausible, actually deliberately Earth-like manner. 
Um, yes. That was done so that it would be familiar to people and allow for role playing um, to fit a little more naturally with the storytelling because some assumptions could be made. And a simple example of that that I like to just use to illustrate maybe something that people don't think about all the time is the planet is earth like it's earth size it's a water planet with like 78 percent water uh it's got one sun and one moon the moon is the same size loosely as the earth's moon we could have done something different you know in star wars a lot of a lot of these planets have two suns or or whatever you can do anything you want of course but we did that on purpose so that the familiarity would be there so, for example, the moons, as you know, on Earth control the tides. Right. Now, on Harn, you can intimately kind of understand how the tides would work without having to reinvent all of that. So that was an example of how it was designed to be realistic and Earth-like, but it's still a fantasy world. And there's some really nice design elements in there that make it very versatile. So it's a fantasy world, medieval period, um, written with like a history, written in the past tense until until the present day. And we, we have a, a, a thing in Harn that's kind of unique, where the present day in Harn is the year 720. And we, in 1983, decided that um, that's when the history stops right players and game masters are welcome to um run the clock forward with their own story and what might happen but we never will and we've committed yeah. to that uh we we don't contradict what what you have done right but the world was written um with a lot of nice gaming um inspirational setups mm-hmm. um in different styles. So there's one realm in the middle of Harn uh, that's a feudal realm with an ailing king and no clear successor. Uh, well, he hasn't died yet in, in 720, uh, but he might die next week. Um, sure. And there might be a power struggle um, and there might be a civil war that comes out of that. It's up to you to tell that story, but it is set up um uh in that the king is described with he has three sons none of them were legitimate um uh, with in marriage um he's still with the mother of the youngest son there's also some other earls barons and people who might have a claim on the throne from either history or a different line or lineage. Um, and so in the book, in the Harn book, and then ultimately you go from there into like the Kaldor book, and there's many pages written about this potential succession crisis. Got it. And we don't ever tell you what's going to happen. We just tell you what might happen. And I've right. personally played it out, played it out at Gen Con once in a LARP. I loved that. Yeah. It was so much fun. And we were all role playing in the truest sense of the word, where you are uh, taking on the role of one of those sons or, or an earl or a baron or a priest, and then just negotiating, talking, trying to work out who is going to be king. And our game master was a very creative guy who had a, invented a bit of a system for this. It, it involved something he created called PowerPoints. And if you accumulated enough PowerPoints, then you were going to be king. Uh, but when it played out, it was unexpected uh, completely how that would go down. And I have heard that that's been played out many times in many different conventions or many different basements. And um, it's just one of a dozen, at least, different setups at the broad level that come across right when you start reading about Harn um, at its at its broadest level. If you drill down from there and you start reading about the city of Tishal, which is in the kingdom of Kaldor, and you can get right down to a map that shows who, which businesses are where. And yes. it's all been thought through. It's all been yes. calculated so that the city 
of Tishal, which is 11,000 residents, but it has an appropriate number of millers and blacksmiths and, and tavern and things yeah. all thought through. And the whole point overall here is that we have created a world that feels real, that you can tell your stories within and you will uh, you will have a background to work with and fall back upon. You will have potentially a good answer for your players, no matter which direction they go. Right. Uh, you'll have some depth and some context to where you might see, and I have heard of many people running campaigns that go on for decades. Yeah. You know? And yet it's diverse because it is medieval. So, to, you know, we all know about the basic concepts of Dungeons and Dragons and, and wizards and, and, and warriors and thieves and all that basic stuff. All of that is in Harn. But actually all of it is integrated and, and thought through. There's actually, it's, it's undercover, but there's a thieves guild. Hmm. And, and they protect each other. And it's modeled on the other guilds, the, 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 the actual more legitimate guilds that are, they're, they're famous from real medieval European history. So right. the analog was ported over to Harn. Uh, and we've got lots of details written about some of these guilds, both like an individual story about a craftsman in a particular town, but also entire books about the guild structure or an individual guild. Um, so it's, again, it's part of the depth it's plausible, realistic. Uh, the economics actually work too. Um, right. The relationships between um, in the feudal kingdoms between the king working down to the earls and the barons and the knights in a in a feudal uh, fealty type relationship. Right. Um, it's all spelled out. It all it's all it's all there, and that's yeah. just a little bit of it because yeah. there's a a part of Harn that's like Viking. There's a part of Harn that's like a dark theocracy. Mm. Um, there's a part that's a bit like a Roman Republic and that, that evolved out of an empire. It's a little bit like, like the historical Rome in reverse. Mm. So now there's a patrician class and a Senate and that whole concept. So if you like that, you can role play that. You can, you can do the Vikings. You can do a, a the theocracy. You can do wizards with um, high-powered wizards. I played a game with uh, we were wizards. All the players were wizards and we were all quite powerful wizards and we were tasked with hunting down another wizard huh. who had gone renegade. And that's a term. Uh, renegade is something that happens. You get declared a renegade if you're a little too uppity with your magic. <laughs> and that's part of the Harnic culture, the way it's written in that it, you can imagine in in, sure. in real history, when people did anything that was remotely black magical, they got burnt at the stake. Uh, so the mechanics, and that's not the right word, but the, the structure of the world is such that you could easily have a wizard blast a fireball in the street. But we've also built in that there might be some consequences for that. And the story, it's again, the game master can do anything they want with that, but there's a, a whole vehicle for a reaction from the public. And then you might see that escalate. And, and the, then again, the other wizards in the story, I was telling you, we were tasked with hunting down this renegade. The reason is he jeopardizes their whole thing. Got it. And they don't want it. So they right. they go out and they hunt him down and bring him back to earth because it. the wizards we've written would rather that magic was mysterious. <laughs> would rather that it might be passed off as a miracle Absolutely. or not quite explained how that happened. Uh, and we did a similar thing with, with monsters in Harn. It's a, a plot device to put a colloquial or trite little term on it. It's a monster factory. Okay. Uh, but it's but there's a whole story. There's a culture there. So in the middle of Harn, just on the north shore of Lake Banath, which is that big lake in the middle, uh, yeah. there's a place called Arakakalai. And at Arakakalai, one of the gods of Harn, 
religion is another big part of Harn, very pervasive and important. But one of the gods lives there, uh, allegedly. And um, <laughs> his shtick is creating monsters. And he, we have a name for them. They're called Ivashu. And the, the, the design of Ivashu is they can they can be anything. It can be any shape or type of, of monster that you want. The Ivashu is just a umbrella name. Um, and th it also allows for some common elements that they theoretically speak uh, or communicate in a common language called Ivashi, regardless of their type. Um, and then a very important element is they cannot breed, so they're neuter, ne neutral, neuter. Um, and then if they are killed or die, the soul teleports back to Arakakalai and the deity recycles it into another creature. Wow. What we got there is a monster factory where the game master can use that as a plot device to introduce absolutely any monster you could ever think of. There are a bunch of unique Harnic ones that have been written up, but you could port one in from your own world or D&D &D or anything, and it would just fit. And wow. you would still have the ability to rein it back in when you needed to. Got it. So that you got the best of both worlds. You, you, you wow. got a, a, a monster factory. If you want it to be cranking out monsters, it can do that. If you want to slow it up, you can do that. And the game master has the control. The players, of course, influential in that sense. Ultimately, it's it's a plot device. It was written in on purpose. When I mentioned at the very beginning that Harn is a world designed for gaming, that's kind of what I mean. I love you know, that. Um, those things are put there so you could use them as the game master, as a tool, ultimately to tell a better story. That is, that's the point, right? Sure. Let me bring up, uh, if you don't mind, some questions have come in. Yeah, let's do that. They were fast I love that. Harn is fantastic. So again, Lost Tribe, with Grant's love of European history, wondering if he has the opportunity to travel over here. If so, what was his favorite trip? And still waiting for the answer. Sorry, he had a, he had a question. Are you going to come yeah. to Essen soon? Oh, man. I have I have been to the Essen convention a few different times. I am not currently booked for it this year. But you never know. I might, I might pull it out. Um, we are represented. Um, Udo Grebe... Um, of Udo Grebe Games is oh. my German partner um, and he imports our board games and Harn um, and also does some distribution um, recently also we did a, a partnership with Ulysses Spiele in Germany to do some Harn stuff as well um, so we might I have a double reason to get back over there um, I spent a lot of time in Europe in my life um, most recent significant time was about six seven years ago i spent several months in in and around brussels um belgium and and western wow. germany um I, I actually had a whole vision which is still kind of in the process of um branching out and making columbia games a, like a multinational and having a branch uh, in Europe, and there's oh. lots of reasons, technical reasons to do with importing and exporting and things sure. that, that were attractive. Um, and that um, I was attempting to solve by being there and and learning about it. Um, so that might have been one of my favorite trips. I've got some other great stories though. Uh, in 2019, we went as as a company to. Uh, the beaches of Normandy uh, wow. on the 75th anniversary of that campaign. And we led a tour. Uh, we wow. were the tour guides, me and wow. my dad. Um, and people who had pledged to join us on that tour, they'd done so actually with the Combat Infantry title, the game um, Combat Infantry West Front that was our first tactical World War II block game. And oh, boy, we could talk all about that too, but uh, you know, sure. how long can we go here? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, one of the pledge levels with the Kickstarter for Combat Infantry was a trip to to D Day's 75th anniversary, wow. and so we collected a deposit at the beginning, and then and then and then the rest later. 
we had about 25 people come on that trip with us. I yeah, man, it was great. Cool. Like, like so great. We yeah, went to all really. the beaches, uh, one after, you know, eat, eat one beach per day, kind of. Um, and we went out at night and walked around the city and we, we spent time in, in mostly our base was Bayer, the town of Bayer, where there is also a, a cathedral and um, the famous tapestry. Um, so there was a lot to see, a lot of great history. And that was the second um, historical European tour. Um, we did one in 2015, um, first one, which was Waterloo. We went to Brussels and we spent four days looking at all the battlefields of the Waterloo campaign. So it's it's Waterloo, Ligny, uh, Quatre Bras, and, uh, and Wavre, the four battles. And we went to all those battle sites and went on a big tour and went, it was just really great. Um, that one, almost 60 people went on that tour. It was a little much. We were like, uh, herding cats sometimes, um, but epic. So actually, I'm super well traveled in that sense, both um, from the luxury of my life. Um, maybe I mentioned early on, my mom worked for an airline. Yes. Uh, yeah. So Excellent. I had some perks. I got to travel a lot. Um, we went to conventions a lot. Um, I, went, I remember going to the, the uh, convention in Eindhoven in, in Holland in 1992. Um, and then I remember my parents went on a sojourn into the Black Forest with my yeah. sister, who was five years younger than me. And I stayed in Eindhoven. And then I went on a big epic journey. I'm 17 years old. And I went on a big epic journey, ended up in Amsterdam uh, oh. and had a great time. Um, and so, yeah, I've done a lot of that. I've traveled a lot. Um, I've got a trip scheduled about eight weeks from now. I will be in Florence and then Rome and then a quick jaunt over to Athens and then wow. a wonderful eight-day cruise in the Aegean, in the Cyclades. Wow, uh, with very nice. On a small boat with like 48 people. I'm wow. super excited about it. This is not one of my historical tours. This is just me and my family going on a good time. Beautiful. Um, really excited about that. But then to segue back to the historical tours, this year, I literally paid the deposit for this yesterday. We have reserved uh, the this part that I paid for is a deposit for a cruise, like a, an ocean cruise. Uh, but we're planning another one of these historical trip tour things to Quebec City. And it's in support, logically, of the Quebec game, which is going to be re-released later this year. Um, that's the first game my dad did. And so there's all kinds of cool things about that. Um, I've been to Quebec also before. It's a cool city. Yeah. Uh, the history is fascinating. So I am going to... Um, lead that tour. M my dad will probably come too, and my mom as well, um, and my wife, and we'll have a great time um, talking about the city, the battle. Um, but the, the part I was mentioning with the cruise is we're going to start in Boston, and we're going to get on a boat, and we're going to cruise up the St. Lawrence River just like the British did in 1759. Wow. And that is a story all by itself too. Yeah, right? that's really neat. It's going to be great. So you guys can look for that um, in, in a Kickstarter later this year, okay. September-ish. Um, and then it'll be a year later, 24, that we'll be going and doing that cruise and walking around Quebec City. Um, we actually will will go to all of the different spots on the Quebec board game map. There were nine zones on that map. Oh. And the zone being a place. And it was a point-to-point -point movement game with roads connecting the zones. <clears throat> we will go to all nine of them and talk about it. And in, in some cases, there are historical monuments and things. In a couple of cases, it's nothing but a shopping mall. Um, yeah. That's a comment in its own regard, though. So yeah. it's, yes, uh, yes. it's really cool. Uh, we're planning that. Um, and the European... Um, the European trip is going to involve this coming summer one is going to involve some stops at some game stores. That's another thing I tend to do. I've 
already scheduled a few visits into some stores in Rome and one in Athens. And um, see, like this, this, this exactly. This comment is illustrative <laughs> of the way that I go about it. And the, you bet. I, I will take you up on that offer with I knew you would love that. I knew you uh, would. And um, Heavy Bison is my beer. It's my Ooh, favorite. There you it's go. One of the only ones that I really like. Uh, and uh, so consider well, that a date. I, I'm, I'm in. Beautiful. And as to whether I make it to Essen this year, it's, it's probably a bit long odds. It's, just, it's, some, it's hard with just getting away. Uh, and, and the one big trip is probably all I can pull off. Sure. Uh, I am also going to Gen Con in August. Um, to to uh, promote the Harn staff, uh, the the new series of Harn hardcover books I heard mentioned earlier too have been a huge success. Yeah, uh, kind of overdue that we had produced some really high quality books to kind of match the high quality presentation. You betcha. Um, but we got there, and we've had great support, and we're embarking on this process. Uh, we're about halfway through doing all the Kingdoms of Harn. It's a few more to go. And then just earlier this year, I did the master book, Harn World, on Kickstarter. We, we sold almost a 1,000 of them. It was hugely successful. Beautiful. And so, you know, that's also it's a wonderful little problem to have. I, I have to bounce around between Harn and the war games and the computer games. And we got some space role playing with high colonies. I got a space block game coming based on Wizard Kings. Ah. Uh, we got a lot of things. It's Good and bad, right? I mean, yeah, the challenge of having to think about different things all the time is a challenge, but it's keeps you sharp. Welcome. It's yeah, welcome. keeps you sharp. That answers Magnus's question. Well, I want to be respectful of your time as well, Grant. Anything else you want to uh, bring in or, or highlight before we uh, leave? Well, I, I'm flipping through my little catalog uh, in in a moment of downtime there while you were talking, and I thought I should at least mention the other two games. Um, that I have in the catalog that we didn't come across yet, which sure. are uh, just outliers from um, everything we've been talking about. Um, and they are The Last Spike and Slapshot. Yes. And uh, they're, they're odd ducks in, in, yeah. in how they fit into what we do. But they're not so odd if you realize uh, and think a little bit more about Tom Dalgleish and the way that he designs games. Because right. these are both his games and um so the slap shot is a hockey game right and it, it's um there you go a lot of people played the heck out of it back in the day is yep. it, it was released in 75 and it's a card game about hockey it's a spoof um in a lot of ways it it doesn't it's not a simulation of, of of hockey with skating and passing and shooting and scoring and all that you're the manager of a team and the the players are cards and they're defensemen and, and and forwards and a goalie and you have to maintain the ratio of of the three two one three forwards two defensemen one goalie in your hand that's your team uh -huh. players are rated numbers one to ten bigger numbers better player loosely the process of playing this game is to try to improve your team with a draft or a trade which is a little bit like a theft uh from another player um, and then if you think you can win a game, you challenge another player to play a hockey game. And a hockey game is played out a little bit like the old card game War with a quick bam, bam, bam through the six cards of your team. Comparing numbers, big guy gets the goal loosely after the six cards, somebody wins. Uh, and that win goes uh is accounted for on the season standings and then you try to do it all again it's it's a lark the players are are kind of punny names of different um uh, hockey players like uh, like chief sitting bench or um <laughs> captain hooker or different things like that sure. um, and they're, they're funny artwork um so this classic game's been around since 75. We, we brought it back into print in, uh, I don't know, 2011 or something like that. And um, we also have an app for it on uh, iOS, Apple phones. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's nice. really cool. first class and it's free. Yeah. Go get it. It's free wow. app. It, it, there's ads in there that you can buy away if you don't want them, but it's free. <laughs> uh, 
it's plays with AI. So you play against it and it's the, one of the best things you can do when you're like waiting for a bus or something, sit there and, and play a little slap shot. Uh, and super quick before I lose um, a run out of time here, I mentioned the other outlier game, which I'm really pleased and proud of. We call the last spike. Amazingly. Also a classic it was first published in 76. Um, re-released in 2016 um modernized um graphically and mechanically um although i the, the real core of the game didn't change which is building train tracks and completing routes and and cashing in uh on the real estate that you have when those routes complete that's uh fundamental to the last spike since since the dawn of time nice. but the um newer version it's way more of a gamer's game. Um, the original one had uh, dice in it and a Monopoly style roll and move track, which left you with a little bit of a challenge about controlling your strategy. So we've come up with a more modern mechanic with uh, where you have a choice about what you're doing. It's a tough choice, which track to play. Uh, and, and the implication of it is, is, the difficult choice because someone else might make some money out of your play. It's a beautiful, beautiful game involves building a train track from uh, St. Louis to Sacramento across the West in the 1860s. Historically, there were multiple routes that were built kind of at the same time. um, And that's how this game works. And so the, the train could go North or South or middle or any combination. And when it gets across the country, the game ends the player with the most money is the winner at that point. Nice. So collecting property is actually a means to an end along the way. Um, it's an absolutely magnificent experience. The rules are just one page. It's really simple. Nice. But it's deep. It's deep, deep, deep. And you will have, you can play easy with your eyes closed almost. And just play a block, pay, pay for your track, build it, move, go. Yeah. Or you can really think and analyze and make analytical decisions and you can kind of come up in the middle there i've had so much fun with the last spike uh, the most diverse game we've got the most every man game we've got uh, surprisingly well maybe unsurprisingly to to the audience here most columbia games players and fans are men uh, most Sorry. historical gamers are men even most role players are men um Last Spike um, <laughs> is my best game for families, for women, um, for everyone. I have a, one of my favorite photos is, is sent by a, a gamer, Brian MD, I think is his name. It's him yeah. playing The Last Spike with his father and his son. Nice. His son is about 12, the father is 80 and brian is 50 or something and you've got three generations having a great time playing a game it's not that common that you can find a game that will satisfy that so uh really happy with that one um and it's probably my go-to when i'm i'm introducing the company or teaching um people how how to be a gamer at all you know from the real world where people don't play games except at Christmas or <laughs> giving. Um, Last Spike is a beautiful segue into the entire world of gaming. The, the hobby Got it. Of it. And so um, if you're a gamer and you want to have some more gaming friends, dig out the Last Spike. Uh, worth mentioning is it's a, it's a Tom Dalgleish design, which means just like in Slapshot, both of them, less is more. Simple, wow. but deep. And almost everybody likes it and it doesn't matter whether your bias is towards the history games or, or other things. This has just a nice little blending economics, a little bit of history, a little bit of player interaction, a little bit of inferring what your opponents are up to slightly cooperative, but not really. What's uh, the uh, game length generally? 45 minutes. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that's nice, awesome. short, sweet little game. Also flexible. You can play it with two players then that's definitely 45 minutes, maybe maybe an hour with two players. Oh. Uh, and it's a bit of a knife fight because oh. you've only got one player to work with. Um, 
So he's your opponent. When right. when you go to the other end of the extreme, there can be six players, uh, and it's a little more wild and woolly there. You got to kind of work with all the other players and what they're doing and deal with it. Uh, and the game can take as little as 20, 30 minutes with that many wow. players. Because really? So it actually play. gets faster with more players. Yeah, it does. Wow. It also, cool. uh, the arc of the game is fascinating too. You start the game with a blank map with no tracks on it, and you have your little grub stake of money that you start with, just like in Monopoly, and, and no land. And, and you start every turn, you play a track, pay for it, uh, and then you buy a land and pay for it. Um, oh. uh, the tracks are obligatory. The land is technically optional, uh, but you want to. So the, t- the mechanic is play a track, pay for it, buy a land, and then draw another track so that you have another track to choose. You have four in front of you. And they're blocks, by the way, these little tracks. Nice. And they stand up with Fog of War. Yeah. So I... I got my four tracks and you got your four tracks and so does Joe or, or Judd and no one, you, we don't know, right? Like, like Scrabble tiles, you know, uh, you don't know what your opponent's going to play or yeah. Stratego in that sense, but you can try to infer it from what they've been doing, what properties they're collecting, things like that. Anyway, the mechanics are um, lead to an arc. It's really intense. You start out with some money, you're playing tracks, you're buying land, and it's a while before the money starts flowing back in. Yeah. If that happens, the trigger for that in the game is when tracks complete a, a segment between two cities. At that point, there's a payoff okay. of the real estate um, at either end of the track. If you own it, you get a payback. Uh, and every player gets a payback. Every player that owns that real estate it's a card. It's like a deed. It's like your classic Monopoly deed. Um, but if I've got um, one of Dodge City and one of Denver, I'm going to get paid from both ends. But if you've got two of those, you're going to get paid more. But it doesn't uh, matter who plays the track. I might have to play that track that causes you to get paid more than me, but I might have to because yeah. I'm running out of money. So the arc of the game, start with some money. It goes down, 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 and then it gets to be a little bit of a game of chicken. Who, huh. can, who can tough it out the longest before either going bankrupt, which then doesn't really happen. You end up having to sell your land back to the bank to stay out of bankruptcy. Uh, it, it's not good. Um, <laughs> what um, You get this middle point of the game where it's tense, and you're like, can you survive? And you then have to make a decision that will – perhaps create some money or maybe the other guy will have to make that decision first. And that's, that's part of the game is try to survive. Uh, And then the last phase of the game, the money starts rolling back in rather quickly. Sometimes you start with like in the neighborhood of $50,000, you go down to near zero and you come back all the way up to a hundred, 150. Sometimes it's an incredible arc. And when you're done with it, you count up the money and the most money wins and at least most of the time, the players just say, well, let's play again right now. Wow, very nice. And that's not that common either. You no, know, uh, that's beautiful. So highly, highly recommended um, for literally every gamer um, of every genre and um, every age. Um, the game also won um, a Mensa Award, Mensa Select um, Award for being uh you know a smart people game yeah. um, and i'm i'm quite pleased with that outcome um uh, it says a lot and it it, does. It's, it's again it's the combination of simple and deep that that get you there uh, literally one page of rules um and uh and yet timeless depth and, yeah. and lots of similar with slapshot uh simple and easy and, and deep and and if you like these games, um, the ones that we've been talking about before, you like the historical block games or you like Harn, then one of the reasons you like all that is because you like Tom and my dad and his style 
Sure. And I assure you, you will like Last Spike and Slapshot. Even if you're not a hockey fan, it won't matter. Sure. You'll like yeah, the depth. The depth of even Columbia Games is displayed with everything you've talked about there. Yeah, it really is. It's awesome. diverse and, and adaptive and and a wonderful experience having done it all, all these years. I've been very intense of, uh, for like 30 years now of my life, my adult life. Uh, but I even was was doing this as a little kid, little helping with the packaging and the in the in the warehouse. And then I remember my first little task. Um, I got into the role playing first when I was little, yeah. the hard stuff. And my dad got me going on um, on ships. He was a sailor and a merchant marine coming out of uh, Scotland in the in the sixties. So he has a passion for ships in the ocean, and he invented a part of Harn, a book called the Pilot's Almanac. And some mechanics and rules for moving ships around and provisioning the crew and this and the, and the stuff you need, raising the sails, tacking, all that stuff, dealing with briefs. We had all that, and it was a game. We played it on hex paper, and I played it with my friend, and my dad was the game master, and I loved it. And then he tasked us with doing some development work for that product. It it had all the different ships that are types of ships that are in Harn. Um, like described and written up as an example, a tantamount to a character sheet in, in role-playing for a ship with the stats of the ship, right. like the, the length and the beam and the height and the cargo capacity and the speed and all that stuff, how many crew you need, all that stuff. And there's a bit of a mathematical system formulas for calculating all that. But my friend Joel and I did all this. This is before spreadsheets. Like, oh. uh, I mean, th I guess they might've existed, but 1987, and we did all this kind of by hand. And it was my first little project when I was 12 years old and and where my name and my friend Joel's actually in the book. I love um, it. And uh, they really never really looked back. But, of course, it, it was until um, I was um, got through high school uh, and, and um, 18, 19 years old. And we actually picked up our family, the whole family, and moved from Vancouver, Canada to the United States. I mentioned at the wow. beginning being in Blaine here, right? Um, and that was a business decision. Um, was the market is bigger and stronger in the States and importing, exporting to Canada was a pain in the ass. Uh, but from that point on, I've been really full time with 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 my dad, and it's been really good. Beautiful. So, um, 50 years, 51 out really actually. And, and if I can do it for another, that that would be great. Another 50 oh, yeah. or however long I live or maybe it another you've generation. Never worked, you've never worked a day in your life if you love what you're doing. Not really, exactly. <laughs> you know, that's that's really true. It's um, It's been an absolutely marvelous life. Uh, it, it comes with some costs, right? And paychecks were not always on time or, or available uh the family dynamic is a little intense um uh, okay. there's there's been some epic um conflicts and the, but then family you know works it out so sure that uh that that's the glue that keeps it all together overall uh i wouldn't trade it not not for anything and half of the reason is the games and other parts of the reason are getting to work with the family uh, and then all these wonderful fans and customers and, and this feedback and warmth. Absolutely. Um, that Absolutely. comes. So well, I, I'm, I'm lucky, I'm happy, and I'm going to keep doing it. And I appreciate, you know, the listeners and, and, and you for facilitating and helping me spread this news. Uh, Thank you. And I'll keep doing that. I mean, uh, as you get projects that come out, I would love to have you on. We can highlight those and really – you know, uh, try to to let folks will. know what's out there. It'd be great. I will. Um, I, I absolutely um, will make a point of it. I've made sure that your name and, and email are active in my list um, for for spamming. So we'll spam you, <laughs> uh, and you will. That will lead to some discussions. Uh, you bet. Well, hang on the channel here. I'm going to wrap up. Thank you to all the folks that came in and all the questions. I'll apologize now to anybody if I didn't get to your question. Um, I apologize. I tried to get them up there on the screen so they could be seen. And I think Grant did a great job of answering them. 
but every once in a while I'll miss somebody because it's in the side. Um, just uh, keep coming on or uh, put your uh, you know questions again in the comments. And if Grant and I see it later on, we can always come in and answer it then or I can find that out. But again, thank you sure for everybody. Yes, and thank you, Grant. My pleasure. Really, really fun. And uh, those two hours just absolutely flew by. I know. Right? I, I did know. not that notice was, that at all. That was uh, perfect. But, uh, perfect. I'm, I'm uh, ready to go wrap, wrap that up and, and on with the day. I got a bunch of things to do. It's a beautiful day out here. I mean, finally oh, yeah, spring. I know. Uh, got it. Well, well hang so, tight. I'm going to wrap it up. I'll end the broadcast again. Thanks to everybody and look for more stuff in the future and go check out that Kickstarter uh, for Julius Caesar, the enhanced edition. Yes, please. There's just a few days left on that. Um, your support is appreciated. The game's coming out regardless. Don't feel like Beautiful. it's an obligation to have the game, especially. But uh, we really um, appreciate it, the support um, and and the passion. So Love once it. again, I'll sign off with that and say thank you. Happy Saturday. Got it. Thank you, everybody. See you guys later.